Hey, Elise Pickett here with The Urban Harvest, and today we are going to be talking about biochar. It is an absolutely amazing soil amendment, and I have Paul Crawl with PK Biochar here to share how to go about doing um, this on a home scale. Um, we are going to be going through the six steps to make biochar at home, and I want to make sure you follow it all the way through because step six is critical and a game changer. So hang out with us today and learn how to make biochar at home on a small scale. Why do you think it is the most beneficial thing we can include in our gardens? Biochar is exceptional at doing three things. It holds moisture in the soil, adsorbs, holds, electromagnetically holds um, plant nutrients, so not just the NPKs, but all the way down the list of all your micronutrients. And then third, it is like the perfect housing and shelter for our beneficial microorganisms. So the three things that plants need to thrive, <laughs> aside from sunlight, yeah. is provided with this resource, biochar. Exceptionally well, yes. In layman's terms, what is biochar? Biochar is charcoal specifically for use in the soil. It's used in the soil, it won't degrade. So when you bring compost uh, into your garden, that's gonna, that's gonna be used for about six years before it actually off gas in the carbon dioxide and methane into the, uh, mostly carbon dioxide, into the atmosphere over time as those microorganisms actually physically eat the compost. With biochar, it's exactly opposite. You're doing that work, you're bringing that charcoal, that biochar into the garden and it's just gonna keep lasting. It's permanent compost is what it is. I like that. Biochar is permanent compost. It's permanent compost. When I talk about compost with folks, I emphasize the difference between commercial compost and homemade compost. They're basically two completely different animals. Is that difference between home scale and commercial or industrial scale applicable to biochar as well? Absolutely. And not all biochars are the same. Right from the very beginning, you've got you've got to identify your source material. You know what are they burning? You know are they clear cutting eucalyptus or right? Are they using something sustainable like we do? With the I mean we only cut dead bamboo. Once you get to that industrial scale, they're 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 trying to turn everything into biochar. They're trying to turn um, biosolids from New York City into into biochar. And so that comes with all the, all the heavy metals and everything else you'd find in a, you know, in a municipal septic waste stream. So just be careful. Be careful about what you're buying. Know who it's coming from. Try to, try to source biochar from people who have that permaculture ethic. What's step one for making biochar? Step one for making biochar is getting your materials gathered. Right, then you're gonna cut it into manageable sizes. So is this based on the size of your burn area, your burn pit? So basically they fit inside of... Exactly. It can be difficult to maneuver a lot of the stuff if it's too big. And what That's... materials qualify? So I know today we're doing our burn with bamboo and we're yeah. going to talk a little bit about the benefits bamboo is my of favorite. bamboo. Are but there other resources? Any wood, use? any wood, any woody materials will do well in this process. In this process, you want to stick with smaller, smaller diameter, so not heavy, um, big logs. Yeah, ideally. you want to stay anything under three inches is probably best for the open for the open burns. How much material would you need to, let's say, fill a five gallon bucket with biochar? If you wanted five gallons of biochar, you need probably 25, 25 gallons of starting material to get that. Okay, so you're going down about a fifth of the material you yeah, start with about down to biochar. Anywhere from 30, 20 to 30 percent is okay. what you'll end up with at the end. So if you have green, wet bamboo, the burn is going to take longer. If you have drier materials, whether it be bamboo or otherwise, mm -hmm. it's going to go quick. The green wood, you know, try to try to get away from it as much as possible. If you need to add a little bit to it, make sure the fire's roaring and up, up to temperature. So we were talking about sourcing materials. You have bamboo. Um, is there a reason behind that? You know, I make, I make PK biochar out of bamboo. Mm -hmm because it's really the best material for, for biochar. So if you're out there and you want to plant something on your site, 
specifically for you know turning to biochar get a clumping bamboo um, it grows six times faster than pine right you can, can harvest you know a quarter of the clump every single year and it doesn't damage the, the tree is that the um, predominant reason you choose to use bamboo is because of that rapid growth rate and sustainability aspect um, that's probably the biggest reason but there's so many reasons um, the actual pore spaces are varying sizes all the way through the material itself so that gives you a very big diversity of the microorganism housing so the nooks and crannies are the nooks better and crannies in yeah well they're they're not better they're just more diverse more diverse sizes so, I mean don't feel bad about going and asking your neighbors if they've got overgrown bamboo after five or six years the bamboo stops living and those combs will actually die and dry out while still standing they're very easy to cut so they're very manageable and don't need chainsaws and all these crazy yeah man equipment. no chainsaw i'm afraid of chainsaws still i still <laughs> don't use chainsaws so source materials and then what you need a place or kiln to burn in this is a burn ring we'll need. have a link for everybody if you're in central florida if you'd like to get the burn rings from paul He'll be able to help you with that but if you're outside of that area what could you use instead well i would i would look on facebook marketplace see if someone's selling a burn ring anyone who's using uh, surplus steel piping large diameter anywhere from 40 inches down to 24 inches so you'd All like ideally to be 24 inches in diameter um, to do a, ideally a reasonable burn 36 36 is good for a larger burn if you've got a smaller backyard i mean 24 is perfect okay uh, next would be um so you've got that make sure you've got a, a an area that's clear make sure there's no nothing overhead that's going to catch fire uh, fire safety is a big thing we're lucky it rained last night so we don't have to worry too much about that today but in general you want to make sure you're soaking the area well um, you know hair back tie your hair back make sure you've got protective equipment gloves are always good when you're picking things up uh, sometimes there's a there's a piece of wood that's partially burned that you don't even see. You can burn your hand real easy. And now we're starting a fire? And you start a fire. Yeah. Get uh, get a fire going and you'll slowly start adding the material. Sure. Well, so what is the average time for a burn? Well, in, in general, I like to get, get them done in two hours because it's a lot of work. Uh, it's, it's a lot of heat. So it, it's taxing on the body. And so I don't like pushing it longer than two hours. So we started a fire. Just any basic fire, just start a fire. Start a fire. Add your material. Mm -hmm. Now what are we looking for as the burn continues? Now we're managing the rate at which we add the material. We want to make sure that our, um, our char that we're making isn't going to ash. That's the big no-no. How do you prevent that from happening? We have to keep adding more, more material. Or at the end of the fire, we'll extinguish the fire with... Uh, We'll quench it with water. Okay, so yeah. basically that continual addition of new material prevents the material that is in there from going too far and turning into Exactly, ash. so this is a flame cap kiln. So the flames are actually capping the top of the fire and that's absorbing and using up all that oxygen before the oxygen can get down into the charcoal underneath and turn it to ash. So it's a, it, in a biochar burn, the thing that may differentiate it from your standard backyard fire is the lack of oxygen in the fire. Exactly. We're trying to keep the oxygen out of the char that's underneath the flames. Okay. So your burn ring here is going to be air proof, right? So it doesn't allow that air to Exactly. Come you want no vent holes in or underneath or around. So, so some of, of the, the, the burn um, the burn pits or the fire pits you can get from you know big box stores and stuff actually increase ventilation because they want you to be able to start the fire quickly and to keep it going. You don't want that. Okay. I'm gonna make so sure there's no vent holes at all, all the way around. Biochar burn is no vent holes, nice hot fire, continual addition of materials. Exactly. And when you're ready to finish it's extinguishing it quickly. What are you looking at in the fire that tells you whether we should be breaking things down a little bit or adding more material? Fire has three phases. So when we first put a piece of wood in, immediately you'll see it smoking. And what's happening is water's being driven off. So that's the evaporation stage, right? That's the initial. 
right? Once uh, the wood gets up to a high enough temperature, it starts pushing off the hydrogens. That burning of the syngas is what's causing the orange flame, right? That, that phase of fire is called paralysis, and that's where we want to stop the char. We're going to burn out all the syngas out of the wood, but stop it before it starts turning to ash. And your third phase is uh, oxidation, where the carbon in the char is mating with oxygen and being released as carbon dioxide. We want to stop the fire before it gets there. So as we're managing the fire, we're making sure we're adding, adding more material. Anytime we start seeing that, that gray ash, that gray ash is telling you that that carbon has now been released, mixed with oxygen, is now in the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. So total side note, that you're the whole, trapping exactly. The we're carbon. trapping that carbon. So step five. We extinguish. <laughs> we extinguish the the fire with water. Um, what you're looking for is the char to stop producing um, as much yellow flame, and it'll go down to just the coals burning. So we hit it with uh, a few buckets of water, we the hose on it, and uh, extinguish the fire. Okay, so once the fire is out, we now have a... Sterile, a sterile biochar. Yeah, there's nothing living in that. There's, there's no bacteria, there's no fungus, nothing. And so that leads us to the super critical sixth step of making biochar, Don't which is... use raw biochar. Ever. Don't ever use raw biochar. <laughs> Why? Let's explain that first. Why, because what will it do? Biochar, like we said before, it absorbs water, and it absorbs nutrients, and it absorbs microorganisms. So if you put that in your garden, it will take all the nutrients out of your soil. It'll absorb all those nutrients. It'll absorb all the moisture out of your soil, and it'll absorb all the micronutrients, or all the uh, microorganisms out of your soil. So it will literally rob all of the fertility that you have invested into your soil if you were to take this extinguished product and put it into your garden. Exactly. So you've been telling us that it has all of these amazing properties. How do we get it to that point? Uh, it needs inoculation. Okay. Easiest, easiest, easiest way, mix it in your compost pile. You know, use biochar as your carbon component. Half of your carbon component should be biochar in every compost pile. So basically, instead of the wood chips or the leaf mold or whatever paper products you're using as your carbon source, approximately 50-50 biochar would be a, a nice be blend. Perfect. And then that way you don't have to do anything else with it. Is that correct? Once yep. it's gone through that composting and breakdown process, yep. it will no longer pull all of that stuff through your soil. Exactly. It will provide it. It's going gonna, it's gonna to hold that moisture itself. It's going to have the microorganisms all the way through it. Um, and it'll be loaded with the nutrients that your compost has, has made through, the, through that uh, process. So with the compost, you're gonna let it sit through that process three to six months. You've got finished biochar coming out with the compost. No need to inoculate. If you want it quicker, you can sidestep that and do this process here. And we have to do what I call just an inoculation, right? So we, um, we're getting these uh, beneficial microorganisms in the biochar and we're providing them food, right? We're gonna let them sit for two to three weeks and let those microorganisms you know, uh, bloom using the food that we, we've we uh, we've given them. Okay, so two to three put it out. two to three week turnaround time. Mm -hmm. What are we adding in it to get it to that level? So we need we need a good compost product, and so I use worm castings. Um, once we have that, we need to provide food for those microorganisms. So we provide uh, white sugar. You know, you could use honey or molasses. Uh, do unsulfured molasses if you're going to do molasses. Um, and you need to provide food for the, the fungi. The, fast, the fastest food for fungi is oats. So I use just, uh, just generic oatmeal out of the grocery store. Okay. And then I saw one last, a uh, couple of last additions as well. Um, we do, we provide two types of rock dust in our biochar. Um, we, do, we do a clay, um, a clay kitty litter. It's mm -hmm. called Fuller's Earth. Um, and that's got a lot of minerals. And then we do a, a crushed, a decomposed granite that we get at one of the local rock. And that's uh, for like micronutrients and everything to get into the biochar as well. Exactly. All those trace minerals, mm -hmm. you know, they're available in that granite, in that clay. 
Okay. And so what's the ratio here? Let's say um, we did this on a little bit of a larger burn scale. We have quite a bit of biochar here. Yeah, probably um, But let, let's say, let's estimate how much of each of those products, if they were to use, a, just to estimate a five gallon bucket, if that's their finished okay. biochar. If I was doing a five gallon bucket, uh, I'd probably do a cup of white sugar, a cup of worm castings, two cups of the oatmeal. Okay. Um, and then uh, you really just need trace amounts of the the rock so just dust, a so sprinkling of the, yeah, the rock dust. You can't that. technically overdo it. There's no harm in overdoing it, no. just maybe not underdoing it. Exactly. Okay. And so long as it's there, right? Uh, even a handful, something as small as half a handful in a in five gallon bucket of the of the rock dust is is more than enough. Okay. And so we take it. We've got some water in here. We did all of your amendments, like you said. Um, and now we're just going to put it into some sort of containment system holder yeah, we're vessel gonna, we're until let it, let it, it compost. Two we're to let three it compost weeks. two to three weeks. And, and then into the garden it goes. And into the garden it goes. We now know how to make biochar on a home scale with minimal effort to feed and nourish our gardens and our bodies for Permanent years compost. Permanent compost. Permanent compost. That is what this is. Um, thank you so much for helping make this uh, an obtainable and easy to understand process. Um, if people would like to reach out to you um, for burn barrels or some pre-inoculated biochar or classes in person, yep. uh, how can they find you? PK Biochar on Facebook is, is kind of the, the hub of information at this point. You know. All right, so I will have links down to um, contact Paul in the thank you. Um, notes. And thank you so much for sharing.